Hey, everybody. Welcome to another edition of Yes, We're Here, and we certainly are. I'm Michael Kay, and I'm joined by my colleague, former Yankee manager, Buck Showalter. Buck, how are you holding up, my friend? Good, Mike. All things considered, I'm lucky to be married to somebody I like and, uh, you know, being very cautious and uh, doing the things that all of us need to do, as I'm sure you and Jody are, too. Now, I, I don't take you as a big movie guy, do you? Do you watch movies to pass the time? Because there's no sports to watch. Yes, I am, Mike. Right behind me, I got a list. I'm going down the list. 1917, Midway. Um, not much into the Tiger thing. It makes me feel bad about human beings a little bit. Uh, let's see. Got Ozark back on. Uh, Isn't that a little dark? Yeah. So is life, Mike. You know, it's, not, <laughs> it, it's a little bit dark for me. But I, I, I ain't take it. Criminal Minds. Let's see, The Crown, I love The Crown. Anything historical. Wow. Uh, there was another one I watched the other day. I don't know, they're all running together. Oh, the uh, Olympus is falling, London is falling, something else fell. London, Washington. It, anyway, what else? What are you watching? Besides your uh, I actually, I'm trying to catch up on movies I've never seen, so I saw One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest the other day, which was really good. You never saw that? Uh, at first, yeah. Really? Uh, talented mystery. It's depressing. Mike, what a hey, one of the best baseball movies under the radar, Bang the Drum Slowly. You seen my that? My uncle was in that. My uncle was in that. That's right. That's right. Yeah. He was the first baseman. The NAIL. Huh. Now we know. Yeah. yeah, now you know. All right, so if and when this baseball season starts, but it's gonna be hurry up and hurry. Uh, it's not going to be hurry up and wait. So you kind of did that in 95. You, you managed the replacement players. Boom, the, the lockout was settled. And all of a sudden, you have your, your players back, and they want to start the season quickly. How difficult was it to get everybody ready that fast? Well, one of the biggest mistakes you will make is if you hurry. Hurry, you're asking for a recipe for failure. Uh, you know, we played, I believe, the first game I ever played at the Coors Stadium. We took a replacement team up there. Gene Michael had been told by – the leaders, without naming names, that we were going to play the season, don't worry about the team you put together. And then about three days before it looked like we were going to, Gene Michael took off down to the Mexican League to sign some players. It looked like we were going to start. Then in the seventh inning of that game, it came word in the dugout to me that we uh, had settled the strike and we were headed back to Fort Lauderdale. And uh, looking back at that, my biggest advice would be to slow down. If, if you think you can pick up where you left off, you're making a mistake. Mike, basically, you got to start over. You can't assume anything. What you as much you know, the communication lines are so much better in today's game with the cell phones and email and stuff about your players. But it's just not the same as being there in that environment uh, of spring training. And you, you know, these are very precious commodities. I think I saw more Tommy John injuries in spring training. I'm not sure if that's something they're doing because of the off time. Let's get ahead of it. It's coming anyway. Or uh, I've just never seen so many Tommy Johns during spring training as a result of something you did in spring training. And I think so many people are chasing velocity and chasing spin rate. There's a price to pay for that sometimes. And a lot of it's just wear and tear. But I, I would tell, and I have given, I've been asked a couple of times, it's just slow down. If you think, you know, I think they're going to have to expand the roster to keep a lot of pitching from uh, being physically abused. Now, it's, it's weird, though, because I remember 95, you guys made a great run at the end to get the first wild card, but you started off slowly. Did you start off slowly because of that three-week spring training? I believe, Mike, we, we were very cautious with our pitching, almost to a fall early on. It was the one thing that, that Stick and I and, and the pitching coaches felt like that, you know, we, had a, we didn't have the depth that the Yankees have now, and we couldn't afford these precious commodities to go down. It's one of the reasons why we got stronger and stronger as the season went on, why a lot of people, guys were uh, going down by the wayside, so to speak. Our guys were getting stronger as we got into August. And uh, it's tough because you want to win every game, but you've got to see the finish line and understand the wisdom that's involved in, in playing for the long haul in our sport, which is unlike any other. You know, now, one of the Mike, things I'm sorry, Mike. There's going to be a different sense of urgency now because if we do play, it's going to be a shortened season. So in a lot of ways, you can't afford to get off to that, sh that, that slow start because it could be the season in the first month. 
One thing that scares me, and everybody's just saying, well, we want to play as many games as possible. And they're talking about, Buck, two double headers a week, maybe. I, I don't see how that's possible. I know they're going to expand rosters, but people are going to get hurt. In this day and age in baseball, there's no more Cal Ripken. People don't play every day. How are you going to have two double headers a week? Mike, that's why I said you're going to have to expand the roster. You're going to have to have, uh, you know, 16, 17-man pitching staff, which are going to affect your minor leagues, too. But that's going to trickle down. You know, how are you even – what happens to the half-season clubs? You know, the draft, there's so much unknown. It's like the colleges. Everybody's talking about giving these guys another year of eligibility. But what happens to the incoming freshmen? You know, you've got – now you've got five classes instead of four classes. Uh, someone made a great point the other day that I kind of agree with. They should probably look at uh, having freshman teams again, like they used to years ago, a freshman football team, a freshman baseball, basketball team, somewhere, because someone's got to pay for these extra scholarships. If all these seniors are being granted another year's eligibility, what happens to your son or daughter coming out of high school? Now, you've always loved college sports, and I, I've always looked at you. Obviously, you were a great major league manager. I, I thought you'd be an unbelievable college coach in baseball or maybe even football, which I know you love. Did you ever think about going that route when you were younger? Yeah, you know, we all, uh, you know, growing up in the South, it was a little more glamorous with football and the Southeastern Conference. And uh, I thought I was going to play football. And luckily I had a little knee injury that kind of set me on a different path and where I probably would have. But uh, I'm fascinated by it. It's, uh, uh, I enjoy it. You know, anytime you go to a Southeastern Conference school like I did at Mississippi State, you you have a real feel for the competition and the passion. And, uh, you know, it's been, it's been a part of my off season, so to speak, to get away from it. Now, you went to Mississippi State, but you love Alabama. Did you ever think about going to Alabama? Yeah, you know, I was offered a half-half scholarship. Hayden Riley was a freshman football coach. He was also the baseball coach. And that was one of my claims of meeting Coach Bryant there. And uh, they told me I wouldn't have to play one or the other. You know, my, it was a big thing. My dad was a big Bear Bryant fan. And maybe once a month, we would get in his truck and drive up to Tuscaloosa for about three hours, park, crack of dawn. Uh, he knew a friend with Pinkerton Security would let us in. We would sit in the faculty section because that was the only place that people weren't sitting. And I got to see them all come through Alabama, the great players, Ken Stabler, all of them. And, uh, but my dad made me watch the sidelines, watch the coaches, watch what was going on, the way Coach Bryant worked with the coaches and the players between series. It's pretty impressive. Now, do you ever regret not playing football? And what position did you play before the knee injury? Well, Mike, you got to understand, we graduated 30 or 40 people my senior year. Everybody played. I mean, I, I was a starting left guard as a freshman, 160 pounds. And I played quarterback and safety. You played both ways. I would have been a defensive safety. I got offered a scholarship to play quarterback at a junior college, but uh, I made the right decision. I made the right decision. Buck, I'm telling you what, I hear your stories, and you, you know, you were quarterback in high school, uh, a great baseball player. You must have been the big man on campus. You must have been the big deal in your high school. Well, I, I played basketball. And that's what we did, Mike. That's how we stay out of trouble. You went from one sport to another sport to another sport. You know, so my great, uh, I learned how to go around my back between my legs going uh, and playing at the different neighborhoods around. Uh, I never, you know, some of my best friends uh, lived across the track, so to speak, and I'd go over there and play with them on every every chance I got. And I learned a lot about, you know, how to play basketball. And that was, a, that was something I really enjoyed. I wasn't as good at it as I was other things, but I was the little point guard that dished the ball out to everybody and didn't shoot. All right, let's let's get into. Uh, I want to get yeah, into the modern be ball. Boring. Come on, we're we're stretching <laughs> going to my high school. No, not at all. People love this. If you, I got my high school football tapes over here. You know, how you remember you thought you were good until you watch them, and then you go, "Oh my God, I was terrible." You know, another day, we'll plug those football tapes in and break it no, down. No, we won't. No, we won't, man. Little option. when you were managing, what was the one batter in a big moment you didn't want to face? Uh, you know, Mike, I'd always ask advanced scout, how is so-and-so? There were about three guys in the league at that time that you'd say, are they swinging the bat well? Because a guy like Paul Molitor, if, if he was not just in one of those kind of his timings a little off, you could not get him out. You attacked the whole lineup trying to keep him from hitting in a big spot. Edgar Martinez was like that. But I think a lot of people I, – I kept looking for weaknesses with Molitor. 
he had no real stride. He just had a foot that he inverted uh, inside, outside, up, down. Edgar, we just said pitch him down away and let him do the thing on the right field. If you try to get him out and try to embarrass him, you know, there's not one set way to pitch him. I mean, I know Tony Gwynn, we had a thing before a game one time. We said, listen, guys, we're going to all go somewhere. This is before the shift, so to speak. We're all going to go play somewhere we never played on this guy. Wait, you know, whoever's there. Matt Williams, who was playing. I want you to stand on third baseline. You do whatever you want to. Shortstop, you want to play it up the middle. Of the, play where people don't normally play because conventionally he's hitting 400. So let's try something different. Mike, I'm telling you, he was 0 for 4, 0 for 5, and we thought we figured out the holy grail. The next day, he had, <laughs> next day he had five hits. He looked over at me after every hit and went, no, no, no. Tony Gwynn, <laughs> Tony Gwynn could steer the baseball where he wanted to steer it and could hit for home runs. Well, you saw Wade Boggs. Nobody had more power than Wade Boggs. Some people, but yep. Tony, you know, but Molitor's a guy that jumps at me. Edgar was another guy that really had no glaring weakness. All right, so when you were in the dugout and you had a bottom of the ninth inning and you needed a rally, what was the one pitcher you didn't want to see out there, the pitcher that worried you the most, that it was hard to hit this guy? Um, well, you're talking about starter or closer or period? Whichever, whoever's on the mound in a big spot, who did you not want to see? I got to tell you, a lot of people miss with, when Harvey was pitching with the Angels. He was uh, – Brian Harvey, his – Fastball split, he could pitch with just one of them if he wanted to. I don't know, Mike, I'll leave a lot of guys out. There were so many. If you got to the point where the closer was on the mound with a lead, shame on you. You know, there's something that always happens during the first seven, eight innings that you could have made that not happen. Of course, this is back when guys would pitch two innings as a relief pitcher. Um, but uh, you know, I think uh, Brian Harvey is very underrated. And, and he went through a period there. He was just filthy with a tough split plus fastball, and a strike thrower. The great relievers are strike throwers. They keep the ball in the ballpark, and they have two pitches that they, both of them you have to uh, defend. You know, Mo was like that. You know, Mo was like a great defender, held runners, was quick to the plate, uh, kept the ball in the ballpark, had two pitches, you know. So I think that's what people miss about him. You had to get three hits off him before a run. I, I always remember you telling me, Buck, that, it, it wasn't the joy of winning that drove you, but how miserable it was to lose. So let's piggyback on that. What's, what's the most joyous you ever felt as a baseball manager? The most joyous moment you ever had? Jeez, Mike, I hope it's still to happen. Who knows? Maybe in this, uh, this thing today. Uh, <laughs> what would be great joy is those countries start getting better. But I uh, – oh, Mike, that's a tough one. i got a lot of them. Uh, probably, I don't, I don't know, I tell you, uh, beating the Rangers here in 2012, kind of, uh, that was special because my family was there and it meant a lot to them. Um, uh, I think one thing, believe it or not, Mike, I was behind the cage on the workout day before the 95 playoffs at home. It was right after the season ended. Nobody's there. We're just taking batting practice. You know, some of the media's there. And Mr. Steinbrenner walked by the cage and said, uh, Hey, nice going. And just kept on walking. I went, what did he just say? Wow. And that was, that was about, you know, that was a moment. You didn't get many of those. But he also, you know, when he did give praise, he knew it was special because he, uh, you know, it was your, basically your accolade was getting a chance to do it again. You know, about being there. There's been some great moments, Mike. Being around for Jim Abbott's no hitter. Uh, you know, just some great moments at Yankee Stadium. Uh, I could it'd take hours to do it. You know, it, it, when you when you cover team sports like I have and you've managed and played in it, it always seems that the team is playing, you know, for the team. But I thought the 95 team, to me, they were playing for one guy, I felt. Maybe I'm wrong. I felt that they were playing to get Don Mattingly to the postseason. Did you sense that? Oh, yeah. It was a driving force. It was one of those things, Mike, until you've been in a locker room, wasn't spoken. It was a given. You know, and it's like, you know, we'd be in an advance meeting talking about stuff, and all of a sudden E.F. Hutton would say something, and everybody would jerk around. But, you know, so many times leaders don't realize the weight their words carry, and they have to be careful. Donnie knew that, not in a cocky way, but he knew he had to choose his words and the reflection it would have on his teammate. And believe me, he could, he could get uh, tough. You know, there's a lot of guys, I'm not sure 
guys like Jim Leyritz, Paul O'Neill, I can go on and on. They impacted, they were impacted so much by Donnie's guidance and, and the example that he set. Um, but it was, if you didn't believe me, uh, you know, the pregame introductions and the home run that he hit there. And he went two weeks. He, he told me, he walked in one day and said, listen, I can't hit 260 with this. I'm going to go ahead and try to be the first base with the Yankees. This was about three weeks ago in the season. That meant he was going to torque his back. He was going to do all the work. And if it blows, it blows. And little did I know at that time that he was going to retire at the end of the year anyway. So, Mike, he went for it. And I saw the 11 o'clock whirlpools and back treatments for a 7 o'clock game, all the things that he was doing. And I saw him on the plane back from Seattle. He couldn't even sit down. It was so bad. But uh, to this day, he did a great favor to the Yankee organization letting us know early on that plane so that we could go out and get Pino Martinez before everybody knew that we needed a first baseman. Buck, this has been great. Uh, obviously, we, we should tell all of our, our fans and listeners to continue with the social distancing. I know I'm washing my hands a lot. How about you? Mike, I think all the, you know, we're all gathering information. I think that's the one common denominator that almost 90% of this is transmitted through your hands. So stay ahead of it. Stay diligent for all our sake. Now, for all those that are listening, uh, we're going to start taking uh, questions via mail. So if you have questions for any of us, tweet them to at Yes Network, and please use the hashtag Yes Mailbag, and your question might be used in a future edition of Yes, We're Here. Buck, it's been great talking with you. I hope you stay safe, and Angela as well, and the kids as well, and uh, thank you for spending some minutes with us. Same to you and Jody, Mike. Take care of yourself. God bless all y'all.